to see the numbers, see them growing every month and know that the quality of their projects is increasing. It's all related to the quality. And that's where, where that increase comes from. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I am your host, Ryan Willard. And what an episode we have for you today. This was a sheer delight for me. I got to speak with two of our Business of Architecture clients, principals of AMK Studio, Arlene Edurian and Katie Flores. Um, this was really, really exciting for me to actually sit down and speak with them. I've been working very intimately and very closely with Arlene and Katie for, for the best part of three years. And what they've done in their business has been nothing short of truly inspirational. I really was just a, a pleasure to be able to speak with them, just to capture a bit of their infectious energy and passion and joy and excitement and optimism, which you'll get bucket loads through this as you hear how articulate and how well they speak. But just their clarity of vision and focus, um, how they've made real true business innovations of the way that they've learned to negotiate, the way that they handle clients, the way that they've dealt with their operations, the way that they've um, restructured their roles is really, really incredible um, and testament to the results that they're getting at the moment. So I'll start a little bit uh, about each one. Arlene is an exceptional architect with about 23 years of experience and a, and a multitude of prestigious accolades to her name. Uh, a graduate of the USC School of Architecture, Arlene stands as the founding partner and architect with the renowned firm the AMK Studio and GMD Design Group of California. Her expertise spans across both custom and production facets of residential architecture, in addition to commercial, hospitality, and community design. Arlene imbues each project with authenticity and a meticulous balance between client expectations in the realm of creative possibilities. Situated in Los Angeles and Orange County of Southern California, Arlene is a registered architect across many different states, including California, Arizona, and on the East Coast as well, New Jersey, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Katie, the co-founder of AMK, also holds a partnership role with GMD Design Group and ADU Diggs. Uh, she has over two decades of experience within the construction industry. She derives incredible satisfaction from actively participating in the entire design process, shaping vibrant and habitable residential and mixed use environments. Her involvement commences with conceptualization and extends through community planning and pre-design phases and culminates in the design and construction stages. Katie holds extensive expertise spanning all aspects of design and construction, in encompassing master planning, the formulation of design guidelines, construction documentation, and field of coordination. Her core specialization revolves around the design and construction of single family residential properties. In her leisure hours, Katie dedicates herself to community service, actively contributing to her church, holy faith fellowship in Compton, CA, and volunteering as a co-leader of her daughter's Girl Scout troop. So in this conversation, we look at some of the keys that Arlene and Katie implemented into their business to create a enormous shift in their income, in their revenue. We look at some of the problems that they were facing um, uh, previously. Uh, they were living, in their own words, they were talking about how they were going to go for that feast or famine cycle that so many architecture practices go through. They were getting in each other's way in terms of their roles and responsibilities. They were doing the same thing. They were saying yes to the wrong kinds of projects. And we look at how they grow and evolve their business and how they increase their revenue, their personal take-home salaries, the caliber and quality of the projects. Um, Arlene, in her own words, talks about how they've actually become better architects because they're not forced to work on anything that they don't want to. So we look at some of the principles and some of the ideas that they implemented very effectively to get them to this position 
of success. We talk about negotiation. We talk about role division. We look at one of the innovations that they've taken on of subscription invoicing to avoid pesky late paying clients and how to make sure that they've ironed out their cash flow cycles. We talk about how they've become very focused on their financial optics so they know exactly what's happening project by project and what's happening financially in the business. We talk about how they managed to get their deadlines on track. We look at how they've leveraged outsourcing and become masters of delegations, freeing themselves up to do more high value activities in the business. And we also talk about one of Arlene's marketing strategies called the two calls a day. So this really is a masterclass from AMK in kind of, you know, implementation and really turning a business around. And it's filled with loads of really inspirational goodness. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Arlene Edrian and Katie Flores. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Katie, Arlene, welcome to the Business of Architecture, the podcast. Thank you. Good to be Thank here. Thank you. Yeah, we're so excited. I know. What an, what an amazing privilege for me to be able to speak with you. We've been working together now for nearly three years. You've been crazy. Unbelievable. You've you've become one of the legendary clients here at Business of Architecture. We're what, family. What what <laughs> you're yeah, exactly. We're friends, we're family. Um you guys have been an an extraordinary inspiration for so many of our other clients. And it really is a delight for me to be able to sit down and and talk with you and just and just to kind of share a little bit about the incredible things that you guys have been creating, just to capture a little bit about your you know, your kind of contagious personalities and the energy that you always bring to architecture and to be able to share it with our audience is fantastic. So very, very excited to be having this conversation. And I guess the let's just kind of jump into, um, you know, what was it like? I know, just to tell me about you guys. How did you guys first meet and how did the practice start? Good question. So Katie and I were working together at the last company that we were at, which was a national company. Uh, and we had a good two to three years working together. No, more than that. I'm sorry. It was more that like more like six, six to seven years yeah. that we were working together. And we were running our uh, division, which was, you know, um, a single family division, you know, in California. We were we were the ones pretty much in charge of develop, delivering and quality having a great time working with one another. The energy was great. Synergy was great. And then the recession hit. And uh, basically, I, res I, res I resigned in 2007, 2008, the recession came along. And once things kind of slowed down and shut down, I thought it might be a good idea for us to start our own thing. Uh, and I'm so, so thrilled Katie agreed. She, yeah, she and I were, um, we, we were looking forward to continuing that synergy in, an, in another venture. So I'm glad that we've done it. Um, yeah. But it's been a journey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a great, um, we knew we worked well together from the beginning. So it was definitely a, a good match. <laughs> did, did you both leave the company at the same time or Arlene resigned first and then kind of pulled Katie along Along with exactly. Her? Yeah, had, exactly. I resigned first. I had personal, I had, a, I had, I, my daughter at the time was four years old and mm. I could tell that she wasn't doing very well with the corporate life that her mom was leading. Mm -hmm. Um, and so with, when things slowed down, I fully took advantage of just a little bit of a slowdown to say, I'm a little burned out. I need to take some time off, which became permanent once the, once things really slowed down. Mm -hmm. Um, but I took the time to get my license and my, my personal life in order. Um, Katie, she yeah, continued. So yeah. I stayed on until the very end. I was one of the last couple of employees left in California at the time. And, um, 
basically the offer was to move to the Midwest or stay here. And I was not ready to move to the Midwest. So I stayed in California and we started our own thing. Amazing. So it was great. Yeah. Amazing. So, so, so <laughs> you've, you've got a long kind of experience of working with each other and coming from a large corporate firm where there's loads of structure, I'm sure a very, I know you were saying it was a nice comfortable six figure salary that you were on and with all the benefits and bonuses that comes with that and right. probably, probably not too bad working conditions and hours, etc. to now being in the throes of a startup. Um, what were some of the the challenges and uh, initial hurdles that you were facing and particularly the sorts of things that had you reach out to business of architecture? So many things, but starting with uh, my position in the previous company was to be, was I was the business director of the California division in a national company. So we had established clients. We, we had a really good reputation mm -hmm. um, of delivering and, and producing great work. I thought, you know, no problem. When we start our own little company, uh, some of those clients might follow us. I already have their ear. None of that happened. That was really, really hard. <laughs> that yeah. was really, really hard um, to start this company and like, you know, from really bottom up, just trying to make our own name and brand. Um, and then on top of that, going from a six-figure salary, like you said, going to pretty much poverty level for the next five years and having cash flow issues uh, where we weren't able to pay ourselves, even though our employees were. I mean, at one point we grew up, we grew up to, to I think a seven or eight person company and everyone mm -hmm. was paid wonderfully and we thought, you know, we could sustain it, but the cash flow killed us on the quality of projects or the spor sporadic nature of some of the projects that just didn't kick in that we were expecting. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we did what we could at the time with what we knew. Um, and well, then, yeah, yeah and we ahead. had great, we had great referrals from, you know, friends and family. I feel like that's kind of how we, we really started. And so it was people we knew, um, contractors we had developed relationships with, um, but they were small, right? And so it was like, oh, you're starting your own thing. So it was a little remodel here, a bathroom addition, that kind of stuff. So it was very small time projects that took a lot of handholding for not, you know, it wasn't worth the value of the project. So um, the amount of effort to just do a small, a small residential addition was the same as what we were putting into, you know, four units or, a, you know, a lot split or something where we were doing a bigger, a bigger project. And so um, our time really got, got sucked into a lot of piddly little small projects that you know, they were great to get us off the ground, but it wasn't paying the bills. Mm. Nope. So, yeah. so beforehand, then you were kind of working on much more commercial scale of projects. What, what were some of the clients saying to you when you tried to kind of pull them away from your original employer or, you know, just to kind of continue the working relationship with them? What were their concerns? Why were they, why were they reluctant or saying no? Essentially, they weren't I, some of them weren't returning my calls like in terms of you know they <laughs> they were under, us. <laughs> they were <laughs> it was hard to just get a, a a leg in and others we had great conversations we would we would get a nice meeting so in an hour long meeting we've actually you know presented all the work that we used to do just to remind some people or you know introduce ourselves to people that didn't know us um and it was great but i don't think they had they could believe that you know a, a I, I hate the term women run, run, run company, but that's where we were essentially. We we're all female company that we didn't design it to be this way because hmm. um, we, it just like, you These know, I didn't say, people. I, <laughs> I know I didn't say I don't want any men to work with me. Like that wasn't, <laughs> that was not part of the dialogue, but it was like, this is what it turned out to be. So, um, you know, eventually now we have a male business partner. Um, but in the meantime, back then it was really hard to, uh, just get the foot in the door. To yeah. Continue the conversation once after the hello that we like to say, you know, <laughs> give a call and say hello and introduce. Uh, but beyond that, it was like, you know, maybe we're, we were just not a good fit. Um, our fees, you know, there was one, you asked me what other things were, were not going well and that the fees were another issue because mm -hmm. we thought by undercutting our com competition that we would have a advantage. And in some cases it might've worked, but we basically um, 
we basically sabotaged our own selves because you yeah. know, we weren't able to keep it up or, or the client was just, you know, they weren't taking us seriously even then. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, that was, that did not work in our favor. Correct. Yeah. Wednesday. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's a really good insight, you know, that, and, and, you know, as a young, as a young startup firm, you might think, oh, great, we've got the advantage of being able to, you've got lower overheads. We're we lean, can we can do yeah, it. Yeah. We, and then, and then it just doesn't, it kind of, it doesn't work. And also we run into this issue of the client not valuing the service. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so in the past, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to ask ask you about a little bit about some of the referrals that you were getting in the in the early days. So you said they were, you were getting them from friends and family to begin with, um, and I'm assuming that was all residential work, and so you were kind of moving away from commercial stuff. We had uh, a fair share of commercial things too, so right. a lot of it was additions. Yes, and you know some of the additions, like Katie was saying we're taking as much work as if we did a, you know, a brand new 2000 square foot home from the ground up. Um, but we also had a broad spectrum of commercial because we wanted to leverage ourselves. We thought in terms of, you know, trying to leverage ourselves against a, a bad economy and do some commercial work, work just in case the residential, you know, economy dived. Um, so in the spectrum of commercial, we did everything from offices to restaurants we did a hotel. Um, what else did we do, do Katie? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> like just a church, a warehouse. Right? I mean, warehouse. we were doing everything. So, I mean, I think that's also, we were just, any job was a good job to us. We, we just had that mentality of, we would take anything thinking it was better than nothing. Um, but the problem was, you know, we're not as up on the, you know, the code for that occupancy or whatever it was. And so we'd have to refresh our memory on that and we'd be spinning our wheels and it really just, it, we shot ourselves in the foot. We, I mean, we were, it really slowed us down. And again, when we were charging such low fees thinking, oh, we're going to get our foot in the door, exactly. then we, we couldn't, we couldn't keep up with the work. And so, um, yeah, it was, <laughs> it was just too bad sides of the same bad coin <laughs> <laughs> right because we didn't have our experience to like leverage in this case or you know be able to come back with negotiating fees because we didn't know what our competition's fees were we were just you know in a disadvantaged uh position to be able to work all the broad you know i mean we had fun we learned <laughs> we we're, yeah. we took from that and we can now do what we can you know, even better today. Yeah. So mixed use is not a problem, for example, uh, <laughs> because we have all the experience with the restaurant work, you know, or the commercial work. So, you know, well, it made uh, us better today. Well, it, well it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, you, you like you say, you on the one hand, you were, you were kind of going in with, with lower fees to secure the work, you know, I've kind of, uh, you, you're not going to be the only architect who's ever done that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, and then also the, you're entering into new sectors and to, into new, you know, new bits of work. So, it, you know, to really be able to cut fine margins on those sorts of projects at a lower fee, you really need to know your processes and your systems and have a, have a, a kind of workflow for that type of typology. So exactly. what, what was, what had you kind of reach out to say someone like, someone like us on the, the business of architecture because a lot of people a lot of practices don't a lot of mm. practices wouldn't wouldn't reach out to a consultant wouldn't mm. have wouldn't have seen it as, as useful what were some of the things that either had you feel comfortable reaching out or what was what was the conversation looking like between both of you at, at well i think this level? podcast was the beginning of it i mean we we listened to your podcast and so we knew um you know just you guys were familiar to us, I think, from the beginning yeah. because of that. You weren't just um, some random consultant cold calling us for uh, just trying to get get money out of us. So I think you had you have a trusted brand. So that was the beginning of it. Um, go ahead, Arlene. You were no, it's fine. I had a I had had a lot of long drives, and I would listen to Enoch <laughs> um, from way in the beginning years of business of architecture, and I was impressed constantly on, you know, whatever little snippet or whatever I learned <laughs> from that half hour drive, um, I saw that there was hope and there was possibilities out there that we potentially, I mean, we weren't tapping and we, we ourselves were 
um, stifled in a way where Katie and I were doing the same thing. So we mm-hmm. both left to design. We both are, at least I, in my mind, I was a good project manager back then. And now I know that she's much <laughs> better than I am. No, so, you know, it's like, <laughs> but yeah, no, but and we're both people, 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 persons. <laughs> so, um, you know, we would both take sales calls. We would both do pretty much everything. And so, yeah, that was a hard part of it. Um, but I think also we, how do I say it? We just, we both have that, the mentality of we want to do better. So I think mm-hmm. we also have that um, self-help or I don't know what the right word is, but, you know, we were always open to um, improvement. Ambition, ambition and right. hunger. Yeah. 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 And so we were never, we were never the people who were afraid of those type of, um, that type of input. And so um, even though we are definitely high D, high I personalities, we, um, we know that there's always room for improvement. And Mm -hmm. so I think we don't have that, those type of egos where we can't take, uh, advice or take recommendations from other people. Right. There were a couple of other issues. One was that since we're so high service, we're so high on service with our clients, we like, we want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing our absolute best. Right. But there are points where, either the deadline would, would have to slide because we got into a glitch or uh, we were, I was a poor negotiator back then in terms of, uh, you know, if, if there's more work needed or if there's, you know, something else, a service that's needed to be able to accomplish this project in a better way. Uh, I, I was just, you know, it, it either wasn't coming or I, was, I wasn't thinking about it. Anyway, there were frustrations back then that were causing cash flow issues. It goes back to that, but it was also not making us the best architects that we could be in hindsight Mm -hmm. because, um, you know, the better we can just uh, see problems coming and also negotiate things so that it's a win-win for both parties, the better the project overall. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Absolutely. It was interesting, actually, going back to another thing that you were talking about was that, you guys were getting each other's way. So you said both of you were doing the sales and negotiating. Both of you were, were doing project management. What, 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 what did that look like in terms of you both? Were you repeating work or how did it you? It was a hot mess is what it, it was looked chaos. like. <laughs> it was chaos behind the scenes. Well, and it was a lot of like, I would take a triage call and then hand it off to Arlene. And then it was just like a lot of handing off back and forth. And then, stuff gets lost in translation or whatever. It it was just, uh, it was not, not an efficient way to run a project um, from start to finish. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, even in the service, it's like, so I'm in the same day, I would be going from designer to marketer to let me draw this detail and, you know, see how I can make this construction detail better or deliver and like pick up a phone call from the field that, was just insanity in terms of Mm. how to negotiate all that in in one day for one person, one brain. And at the same time, none of those were on my part as done optimally as they could be. Right. So it was dysfunctional in the setup (laughs) from beginning to end. (laughs) Right. Um, And uh, you know, it's, it's as good as it is to be able to do all that, one of my old bosses in the past told me, you are not going to be able to do all this at the same time and as mm. one person. It's all going to come back to you. And it and eventually it did. And so with when Katie and I realized, okay, we can we ought to be taking a break to work on us and see if we can just do this a little bit better mm-hmm. and be able to get out of our own way uh, so that we're not going crazy and we're able to do better work, right? Mm. And that was how, well, the possibility with you guys. How how long were you running the business like that, roughly? We opened in 2009. We came to mm-hmm. you in 2020. So for right. 11 years, we did our best to do it ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Got it. And what was the some of the, the impacts like that just on you guys personally and what your kind of lifestyles and other aspirations outside of work did it have an did it have any kind of uh, effect on those things? 
Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, I think it was just constant firefighting. So I think just the stress and the, the, that you're just, you're like always waiting for the next shoe to drop kind of feeling mm. of, um, and so I just feel like we were both suffering from a lot of anxiety and insomnia and like that kind of physical toll of it on us. And, um, we relied heavily on our spouses for sure to like help us get through things. But it's like at a certain point, um, you know, we need to correct this. <laughs> like this is not sustainable. So, um, yeah, I mean, and it's not like we didn't do good work. It's just, sure. it was so, it was such few and far between and getting caught up in the, the crappy work <laughs> that, yeah. um, the, you know, those few golden projects like kept us going, but, um, it was hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, we had a lot of weekends that we worked, uh, you know, we we didn't have any time to work on the business. We were just too busy, you know, taking care Doing of the it. projects that we had. Mm -hmm. And hence, we were just kind of, you know, dependent on referrals instead of really going out there other than a few times a, a year, honestly, uh, to really try to get some good clients, you know, work on relationships because really, ultimately, what I was doing so well before, which I didn't no longer had time for from 2009 to 2020, was to build relationships with new people, um, which is so important, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so that was showing. So, so what was the what was the vision? What was the possibility that you started to see for the practice? Say, kind of just before you started working at BOA, and I know some of the early conversations that we that we had right in the beginning were all about. You know, well, what do you guys want? What's the what's the vision? What what were some of the things that you started to see that could be possible for the practice? Well, starting from the necessity of being paid on, you know, being paying ourselves, it's it's a necessary part of the business, which <laughs> is why work. we're in business. Which is, <laughs> well, we got to make money, and we yeah. wanted to be able to uh, double and triple our income to correct it to where it should be, uh, commensurate with our experience and our value and who we are. Um, and we, we've, you know, that, that has thankfully, uh, come materialized and yeah. come, to, come to pass. <laughs> um, but we also wanted better quality projects. You know, we, we didn't want to rely on just an addition here or an addition there. I mean, we're capable of doing communities, hundred homes here, hundred homes there, or a really nice luxury home, um, or even a mixed use project or Katie does amazing site planning. That is, you know, plotting and working things out with the civil engineer, the the value there, that was a possibility of like making sure that we were appreciated for what we can do. Um, also, I think we have a vision of growing our company to like, you know, a good nine, 10 people so we can uh, hum along very nicely, like a well-oiled machine and everyone, you know, it has like uh, a good place here in our company culture. We, we saw a possibility with that where people want to be here and mm -hmm. stay here. Um, right. cause we had a few issues with employees that left too early. So right. perhaps our process process processes were not, um, in place, uh, <laughs> or, you know, we were driving them crazy, uh, or, you know, for whatever reason it wasn't working back then. And we knew yeah. we had to fix that too. Yeah, I think the projects, for me, the projects is the main thing. It's being able to, the possibility that we can actually charge enough on a fewer projects so that we're able to do the best work that we know we're capable of and we're not spinning our wheels on things that just waste time and are not helping the move the project along. So I think that, that really has been a huge turning point for us to have yeah. fewer, better projects where we can and really better clients. Put our, yeah. And put our best foot forward for them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we wanted to have, um, this, this dream was to have the A level projects that we actually want to work on, right. Where our energy you, and you can see it, our passion mm -hmm. and our energy and projects that we have now is completely different than where we were, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Um, the quality is higher and now we have repeat clients and repeat clients want to work with us because we're doing better because we're producing <laughs> better and our deadlines yeah. are being met and the qual everything is like down the road. It's working much better. So yeah. amazing. Amazing. So, and, and, in, and also in terms of a kind of lifestyle, what was it that you saw was possible for yourselves? 
Well, my lifestyle, um, I want a balance of life, work and, uh, and, and life is one of the key things for me. Um, I had enough years of working with different corporations where they owned me that that quality of lifestyle of balance was much needed and not negotiable. I know the same was true for Katie as well. Yeah. So um, I think, yeah, I think part of it is just obviously raising our kids. I think that was a huge part of it. Um, and coming from a corporate place where it, it just wasn't, it wasn't the norm, you know, they didn't have a ton of women leaders. And so being moms, it's just different than being a dad. I'm sorry, you know, and so it was hard for us to even imagine like maternity leave, what's that, you know, and so I think that was a big thing for us in starting the company, you know, in 09 was just to be able to have that flexibility of, I shouldn't have to work 90 hours a week um, to get 90 grand in salary, right? Like, it's like, I can, you know, one thing is not commensurate with the other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we, we want in, in the um, same thinking of, you know, work-life balance, vacations, long mm. vacations, vacations to Europe, like, just, uh, you know, Katie, I know you go camping and yeah. you can go like and not even think twice that, you know, there's going to be like a fire or something in the background or like, I'm going to be there for you. But in exactly. the meantime, you can do that <laughs> a couple times a year um, and everything's great. Um, we have goals. I, I just love the fact that we have goals. Like we can see <laughs> that, you know, we're shooting very, very clearly a year ahead, five years ahead, 10 years ahead. And those goals come together with uh, lifestyle goals. Like I want to be, you know, traveling more. I might want a vacation property. I might want a boat. I Who knows? But like it's all kind of game now. It, it's all happening. Well, well this, is, this is one of the things I've always enjoyed you know, talking with you guys is, number one, your, the energy that you bring to everything. And number <laughs> two, that you've, you, you have like, you always have a, like a big vision. And anytime that, you know, I might try and challenge you or stretch you. You're like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> let's, let's go for it. What, what are some of your, what, how, what are some of your goals at the moment that you've kind of been, you're working towards, or you can see, you know, out there in the future, 10 years. Are you talking about for AMK specifically or outside yeah. of AMK? Outside of AMK, <laughs> inside of AMK. Because again, there's, there's been all these other entrepreneurial side ventures as well that have yeah. kind of been developing around the business. Right. Well, one of our goals, we, uh, that's a great point, um, was we were working towards being the experts in the modular arena, right? The off, uh, offsite fabrication. So we started a company that does just ADUs um, and they're, you know, modular. We got very good at, you know, speaking to factories and understanding costs and logistics of being able to design something that is modular and get it to uh, the state approval process and then get something potentially in the ground. We haven't, but at the same time, we're working towards we're still it. still working on it. Yeah. So our, our big goal for AMK is to work more on modular housing in the future so that it is more affordable and, you know, sustainable and the world is a happier place. Like essentially we want to see a community come together and then after one, you know, more and more Habitat for Humanity is our, one of our big clients. And we'd love to see like that vision of, you know, more affordable or better um, opportunities for volunteers to help in factories with an offsite construction model, for example, right. with them. For other, our other goals, I mean, we definitely want to grow. Um, I'm, I don't know. What else, Katie? What else? Are, what else are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, I think we we definitely have a, a healthy fear <laughs> of, um, you know, we want to be developers ourselves. I think so. I mean, we that's definitely on the horizon at some point of being able to get our own properties uh, and 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 flip them or add an ADU and, you know, just, just how, how those baby steps might, might grow. Um, we see, we just see the need out there. I mean, obviously we're here in California. It's housing is a crisis that is, does not seem surmountable at all. Um, and so I think that's where 
we we love that we've been able to partner with Habitat for Humanity, but also just I mean, it's everything from Habitat on up to the luxury stuff. So we need every we need all kinds of housing here. <laughs> and so um, I think that really just speaks to our hearts of like, how how can we help get more houses in? And so what's the best and quickest and cleanest and, you know, most efficient way of making that happen. And so we're, we're ready to explore all those options, but definitely we see a lot of value in modular and ADUs. And so we want, we want to get those on as many yeah. projects as we can. Yeah. yeah. That the modular, especially for affordable housing, as we get more and more into it, or even mixing it up with luxury, I think there's opportunities there for uh, production housing. Um, so across the board, I think um, what we're just thrilled that we got into it because it everything is kind of like helping each other mm -hmm. right yeah. even the restaurant work helps the, the luxury housing like all, all of it combined <laughs> yeah um so i don't Amazing. know um well yeah. let's 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 talk about some of the principles strategies and things that you've actually implemented because again one of the things that you guys have been very very good at i mean a lot of people will come and take ideas and then they'll either butcher them turn them into their own <laughs> into their own idea which was more or less what they were doing of the same but you guys have been really you know i mean number one kind of you you, you separated your roles out straight off the off the bat and got exactly. very clear got very clear on that perhaps you could walk us through some of the the keys or principles that you've you've implemented that you found really worked well and how you've managed to make them work so well absolutely well, I think, yeah, I think arlene ahead. is just she's so good at connecting people that it was just a natural ev evolution of her role to be the business development person. And so, I mean, I think one huge thing that she does is it just adds value for our clients is that we're able to, you know, our network is huge now. So we have uh, real estate agents, bankers, contractors, on top of everybody else that it's, it, it's just, she's able to connect people even if architecture is not the solution, you know, so it, we might not be the fit for, they don't need a, an architectural fit. They need, uh, you know, they just need a loan or they need, uh, right. they need to find a new property and it's not about remodeling what they've already got or whatever. And so um, I think just being able to connect people and, and get really into what they need, uh, she's able to make that happen. Yeah. It's, it's about the client first and, the, and building the relationship. And Katie, you do that very well because from the beginning, you're trying to maximize every lot with, respond, with respect to how many units can I get on this? And can I think about the driveway in a more, you know, uh, more Efficient. practical way? <laughs> you, I mean, you're trying to look for all the problems 10 steps ahead of the game, right? In terms of how a project is going to work and that, that you are now focusing on this <laughs> is key because that is one of your superpowers, right? And I and I love that. Um, the other things that we do much better, everything is negotiable, everything, timelines, but as long as it's like clear and expectations are set or we understand, everything has got a why behind it. So we were, we were refer I was afraid to ask why, 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 why? And now everything is about the why so we can understand what the client's goals are so we can potentially not just take the assumption for granted that we've been told as far as program or whatever, but we're working with them, we're partnering with them and we're trying to make sure that their goals are met perhaps mm -hmm. in a slightly different way. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't know, what else? Um, two calls a day. Two calls a day. <laughs> well, the two calls a day goes with the, the fact that the more visible we are, right, whether it's with my real estate agent or it's a brand new client who I'm just, you know, doing a soft, uh, warm call with, and I'm, you know, maybe I've got an introduction to, which is optimal. Um, but just building those relationships so that we become known, we become, you know, the first, second time that they see us, they may not want to like talk, but by the third time, it's like, we're familiar enough that, okay, wait, I, I should probably, mm -hmm. you know, saying hello so, is not scary anymore. <laughs> so this is, so this is a yeah. discipline that you've, you've, you've developed where now in your, in your new role. So let's just go, go back for a second to the, the role division, because that's something so key that so many, and so obvious in a way. Right. And it, yeah. and it, and, it is and so it, obvious that I believe we couldn't have come up with that on our it, own. <laughs> but it, I mean, it's, but it's obvious now, but like yeah, exactly. the, major, the majority of practices never do that. 
So right. what, were, what were some of the things that allowed you, because I'm, again, I've suggested that before to practices and, you know, you're met with, nope, we're going to keep it like this, <laughs> where we're going to do this and I'm going to do that. But what was it for you that, that allowed you to be so clear in the, in the role division? Well, I think some of it is desperation, right? We're just like, well, we're willing to try anything. So if it doesn't work, so be it. Then we could always go back to what we were doing before. But that's um, truth. But reality, I think. No, I mean, I think we we do. We have known each other long enough that we do know each other's strengths, and so you know, we do. We are able to really um, help prop each other up on the right things and bounce ideas off each other. I mean, it's not like Arlene is signing contracts without touching bases with me or sure. anything, but we're, you know, we're always just, um, we're, we're bouncing, we're, yeah, we're playing off each other's strengths, I think, it, is really what we're doing. And um, yeah. Great. Yeah, that, that clarity was key for us to uh, just be more efficient at what we do. Yeah, and, and it's, it's helped the quality of the projects. Yeah. Amazing. Um, tell us a little bit about some of the invoicing strategies that you've, you've implemented to kind of iron out your, your cash flow. Yeah, so I think one of the things that started it is, you know, Autodesk and all of these other software companies are doing it now, right? They do the subscription service where you don't pay for a CD with your software on it anymore, right? You you pay a monthly fee and you get maintenance and you get all of this wonderful support, you know, with that with that fee. And so for us, um, we were really again the cash flow was a huge issue, and <clears throat> we weren't able to. Uh, deliver on deadlines the right way. And so by doing, by moving our clients to a subscription model of billing, we're able to plan out the project. We plan out, you know, different phases and different milestones. And um, so that, that rate might change. It's not like we charge the same 10 grand a month for everything. It's just mm -hmm. sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but it, it really has allowed us to keep projects on schedule. It helps our clients um, to, it's predictable now. So they know what to expect. We have, you know, we have meetings set in into the schedule every month or every, you know, biweekly or whatever it needs to be. And so um, it really helps them with their decision making. They are able to give us feedback quicker because they know what to expect and nothing is a surprise and we're able to keep the bills paid. And so we're not worrying about, you know, in the back of our mind, having that anxiety we had 10 years ago of where, you know, where's the next check going to come from? You know, who's going to pay us today? <laughs> Fingers crossed someone gives us a check today. Um, <laughs> and, and it's truth because every yeah. project that we have that is subscription based is running differently right now, as far as the collectibles, than things that are not on subscription and it's it the the developers go you know sometimes i'm they go back to the old school ways of like can i just carry can you you know 90 days ars like it's a norm right but yeah. on the subscription model it really is a win-win because the project's not top loaded all of a sudden mm -hmm. it is very evenly loaded for an entire span between due diligence sometimes all the way to construction documents right and it helps spread that hefty design fee out a little bit so mm -hmm. it's a win-win for the client in that way but i love the subtle accountability that we have between us because not only are we held being held to the timeline as katie said so are they because for me to hit a timeline i need your feedback but right. it's teamwork in that way but the clients love it because now things are predictable like you said katie mm -hmm. amazing but it's not easy to to negotiate this kind of stuff surely how did you, how do you do this? How do you, how do you convince somebody to, to, to go along with that? That would be the, the first thing I would imagine most you know, people would have an objection with. With unsophisticated developers, it's rather actually easy uh, because, you know, we, we basically um, state that this is the way we work. And mm -hmm. that's done in a very casual email in the beginning or a casual conversation in the very beginning during a, a pain, right? Perhaps not, if not in the pain call, right after the pain call, right? Just right. in the beginning, like just right there. Um, and they appreciate that we're being forth, like upfront and saying, this is the way we work because it's a win-win. We actually are looking for your, um, uh, for your interest. interest as well, yeah. because 
look at this timeline that we're going to stick to, which, mm -hmm. you know, we can control ourselves. So we can, we can, we can uh, say that we can stick to timeline between due diligence and construction documents. Getting into the jurisdiction is a whole different matter, but at the same time, we'll work towards a deadline with that in mind. I mean, I think the main thing is just the fact that it's already proven itself for us. So we're able to tell them, you know, this has worked really well for us on other projects. And so it, yeah. it helps, you know, everyone from the custom, the high end oh. custom home client, you know, it helps them make decisions because they're, you know, they feel that pain in their pocketbook when they're like, oh, I got to pay them again next month. I better make a decision on that countertop or whatever <laughs> that they were holding out on. And so um, I think that, it helps all around for, you know, yeah. for the custom with, home client all, all the way to the developer. Yeah. With the more sophisticated developer, it does take some negotiating. It does take mm -hmm. a conversation. It does take a pain call in itself just to be able to say, ha how has it worked for you when, you know, the architect charges 30, 40% of their fee up front in the first yeah. month or two of working together? Um, you know, and they... After the first project of working together, even if they want to stick to the old way of, you know, percentage based uh, billings, um, more likely they'll realize they, they listen yeah. on the second one. OK, you know what? I, 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 I'm, I'm open to this now, but I, it's oh, a matter so of trust. Once so we build trust. So interesting right? that the, that the, yeah, the, the, the kind of less experienced developers. Yep. Yeah, let's, let's go ahead and do it. And of course, yeah. The, the more experienced ones will take a little bit of a little bit of um, caution to it yeah. to begin with. They're just so used to working a different way, so it's, it takes a little convincing. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, let, tell us a little bit about some of your leveraging outsourcing teams and and your kind of mastery of delegation to grow. That's and really been the team. a game changer for us. Um, cause, uh, with the level of, with the amount of design work we have, and this goes hand in hand with giving up some, a lot, right. Even with our definition of roles, we had to give up some things. Mm -hmm. So although I love designing and I am, I want to say like, I help vision things, you know, right along with Katie and how things come together. I should not be the one on SketchUp. I should not be <laughs> doing the 3d renderings myself, even though it's fun perhaps, yeah. but at the same time, not where my most uh, value lies. Um, so Katie um, has done great with, she's got, you know, she's usually the point of, um, you know, communication when it comes to drafting teams and things, but even with the design teams. So we have a national team that we work with. We're able to outsource work to them on the design or drafting front. And then we've got a couple of 3D Renderers, rendering company, yeah, companies exactly. that we outsource. So we've got um, a lot of work being done that would not be possible without the outsourcing. We'd have to hire. Yeah. And we well, have And I think just in addition to that, just delegating administrative stuff. You know, we have a bookkeeper now. We have an IT guy now. Like stuff that, I, why am I doing this? This is ridiculous. So yes, I'm the operations person, but like that doesn't mean I need to be you know, doing QuickBooks myself. <laughs> so I think that is huge too, right? I think so some of that was a huge eye opener with with BOA was just, we need to be able to delegate some of these lower value tasks to, um, it, that's not what a, a business owner, what a high C-level executive <laughs> should be doing. <laughs> Fantastic. And what about some of the the financial mechanisms that you've started to put in place, just in terms of awareness of money going in and going out, how you track it, um, cash management systems that you've now got in place? Well, the tracking is done weekly. Katie takes yeah. care of that beautifully. Um, and the workload, um, as far as the pipeline and what's in, what's what's a possibility and whether or not it is a, you know, the it's weighted based on the percentage imminent, of, yeah. <laughs> of, of the conversation or the, of where the project is in the sales pipeline. In other words, have we had a pain right. call? Has it been just a triage? Have we had a conversation regarding fees? Um, has a proposal been issued? Um, and, you know, just a general feel for the relationship with the client. Like, what is the possibility that this project is going to become a real uh, signed closed project, right? Contract signed. Um, that is being tracked so much better 
now than it was yeah. before. Uh, and, you know, I want to say uh, we're doing maybe four or five times better in terms of maybe if, if something, if our, if our pipeline was um, 400,000, 500,000, now it's like almost 2.5, whatever. But like my point being is it's five times the growth and it's wow. weighted. So yeah. it's great. Amazing. Yeah. And I think just again, I mean, obviously to go back to 10 years ago where, you know, we were barely scraping paycheck to paycheck kind of a feeling at some points um, that now we're it, it's just it's so freeing to have um, be able to see, you know, on a quick spreadsheet. OK, this is what we this was our revenue last month. This is how many um, you know, whatever, just just having all of those financial that data just at our fingertips at a given time is huge. And um, I think before, because it was so bad, it was a scary thing to do, right? It's like, I don't want to look because I know we didn't make enough money last month. Whereas now <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's just, it's very freeing to see, to see the numbers, see them growing every month and know that um, the quality of the projects is increasing, which is why, you know, it, it, it's all related to the quality. And that's where, where that, yeah increase and, comes from and so now we have a backlog of work ryan which you know and so um essentially that's the most liberating for me because we're able to pick and choose the projects that we work on which is exactly where we want what we wanted to do that was a possibility that we had created for ourselves when we first started working with you is we wanted better quality projects better quality clients and so it makes us better architects go figure because we're not running around <laughs> with our heads cut off like, you know, chickens. Um, and, you know, now it's like everything has got purpose and, uh, you know, it, it's, we have time to do stuff. We're, we're just, even though we're very, very busy, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're, we're, we're efficient at it, but we love what we're doing now. And we're yeah. doing the projects that we are the best at. We're not doing projects that are not, in our wheelhouse. And so I think that's huge, right? We're able to really focus on, on the projects that are, that we know we, we are the best fit for. Right. In, in terms of kind of quantifying some of the results that you've accomplished over the last few years, how would you do that? What, what kind of multiples would you be looking at? How would you, how would you measure the, the kind of growth of the business? Good, good question. I'm going to be loose about this at the moment. Um, so, uh, not, like I said, the pipeline has grown five to six fold easily. Yeah. Um, our multiplier has been has has is much more efficient. I want to say three times, Katie. Yeah, is that I correct? would say we're somewhere between two and three times at least. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So crazy, much better. Amazing. Um, and the the outsourcing, I'm sure, is a huge factor in that because instead of having to pay for an entire employee on top of, you know, all the California restrictions here, mm -hmm. you know, outsourcing is, is, is a win-win because yeah. we're helping somebody else and, you know, they're able to work on with many more clients and we're able to make use of less fees. Yeah. So we pass that along to our clients. Amazing. What is the thing that you're most proud of in terms of what you've accomplished from the, from in, in the kind of the whole life, life cycle of the business? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Yeah, that's hard. Um, I think for me, I think it's just our our roles and being able to really support each other better. And we're not stepping on each other's toes. We're not at each other's throats. We're you know we're we're doing our superpowers. Like Arlene yeah. said, we're we're each focusing on what we're the best at, as opposed to messing around in stuff that doesn't that isn't our forte. For me, it's twofold. One, I had a celebration when we were able to match the incomes that we left behind when we were working for other people. <laughs> yes. That was huge. Yes. Yeah, it was so yes. huge. I'm like, oh my God, we did it. That, what I thought uh. was great income back then is now going to become even better now. Yeah. And it has become even better now. And we did it, right? Yeah. That was a huge pro proud moment right there. And then the second one is that we've got, like, I can look at the workload and say, we've got repeat clients. And these mm -hmm. repeat clients, like, you know, half of these are repeat clients. Oh my gosh, that's like wonderful because we're doing something right. So between yeah. those two was awesome. 
Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Brilliant. Brilliant. And what's next? What's the, what's the, what are some of the things that you're, that are, that are in the vision at the moment for the next well, coming years? Um, you know, I like the fact that we're working on community centers in the form of Chabad. Like we've got a Chabad and potential second Chabad right now. And um, that is fun. That has been really, really like great to, you know, spread, spread, spread our joy and our, and our wings on. Um, and that's great. And then beyond that, a lot of affordable housing, I would say, right, Katie? Yeah. A lot more habitat. Hopefully we can um, tap other divisions of habitat and see, you know, how we can help even more. Uh, the modular is still Huge. very much yeah. a part of this. So we can uh, see how we can make uh, communities more um, affordable and sustainable at the same time. Um, yeah. You know, and just a bigger team. I want to see our company culture be wonderful and, you know, take a retreat maybe once a year or something like that together and uh, go from there. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation. An absolute joy to speak to you both and a real, just lovely to actually just to sit down and, and listen and for, for the whole, hear the whole story and the kind of a little reflection. So thank you so much for Thank your you, Ryan. Thank yeah. you, Ryan. Thank you. You've been our coach for the last two and a half years. So thank you so, so much. <laughs> My absolute privilege. My absolute privilege. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.